about a, uh, a topic. This is going to blow your minds. Um, let me start with a question. Who here is planning to work in government? Who's not already in government? Who here is planning to work in government? By a ra uh, raise your hand, please. No, no, now's the time where you raise your hand. If you're nice and high, because we're going to do a poll. This is a benchmark. One, two, three, three. The purpose of this session is to be life-changing for one of you. So our goal in discussing innovation in government is for actually one of you, one more of you in this room of highly talented leaders to decide to work in government sometime in your career. We will redo the poll at the end of our panel here. Uh, for those 90 of you who didn't raise your hand, what are some reasons keeping you out of wanting to bring your leadership to government? What's that? You're already there. Got it. That's, you guys, you guys are already there and we appreciate that you're there. For the, yes, in the back. Fear of being ineffective. Fear of being ineffective. Tell us a little more about that. Okay, fear of being ineffective, the lack of being able to make a difference. What are other reasons keeping innovative leaders out of government? Yes, sir. They're not connected, they're siloed. They're not connected, they're siloed, the various parts of, of government. What are other reasons keeping successful leaders out of government? You want to stay married, so. <laughs> the environment is so The environment is toxic, and you want to stay married, right? So the perceived cost on your your you know the personal life and and and, and doing this type of service. All right, we have a, a very special treat today. We have three real live private sector leaders um, who leapt into the abyss of government leadership. And we're going to talk about a few interesting things, all of us here. That's why we're going to leave the house lights on. This is an interactive discussion. And what we're going to talk about are, are, are topics like, what is leadership in government really like? Like, how do you innovate in government? We're going to touch on, on what seems like a bizarrely unrelated topic, which is, what makes great leaders happy at work? Like, and I mean you all. And, uh, and hopefully it'll be uh, fun. So, so get your energy level up. You've you had uh, some amazing experiences over the last couple of days. It's been long days, but uh, let's, let's do this. So uh, folks, just a, a word on who you are, where you came out of, out of the private sector, and how did you decide to get into government? Uh, Kathy. Sure. So I'm Kathy Nesbitt, and I am responsible for administering uh, the executive director's role for the Department of Personnel and Administration. So many folks sort of scratch their head and wonder what exactly that is. So I am responsible for everything that isn't in one of the other departments. <laughs> all other duties is assigned. So I have all the mail services, all of the fleet, all the property management for the metropolitan area. I'm responsible for all of procurement. So some $8.3 billion in spend. Everything. $8.3 billion in spend. <laughs> yeah, everything from... Road barriers and the Department of Transportation to this is, a, paper. this is a big job. What did you do in the private sector before you got into government? So before that, I was in practice as a employment and labor attorney. So worked for Kaiser Permanente as an HR professional, mm -hmm. and I worked for US West. Worked for Mountain States Employers Council. Aaron Kennedy, how long have you been working in the government? Jeff Smart, I've been working three weeks and four days. Three weeks and four days in the government. Now. As a citizen, I, I'm telling you, I, I, I love great leaders in our government. And, and, but like, what did you do before going into government and how did you make the decision? Well, um, I followed a calling uh, initially, which was uh, this epiphany hit me in uh, walking um, in Greenwich Village in New York uh, to create the, uh, the first global noodle shop. And, uh, do people like noodles? They seem to. Uh, fortunately for me, I wasn't sure if they would at the beginning. Actually, uh, it was kind of a steak and potatoes kind of kind of world back in 1993. But um, anyway, so um, but how did I go from there to hear another calling? So Aaron, for those of you out of town, built Noodles and Company uh, from scratch into you like that sort of uh, I like cuisine that appropriate so metaphor. Culinary. So he he whipped up this uh, multi uh, hundred million dollar multi uh, hundred store multi thousand employee enterprise 
from scratch. Before that, he was a uh, Pepsi executive in brand marketing, brand management. Uh, you know, the competition for this one. But anyway, um, we'll hold that against it. So now, like, how the heck did you decide to do a stint in government? Like, what were you thinking? Well, I got a second calling, uh, Jeff. And, and this time, it, it was you calling and calling and calling. Um, and, uh, and, and you said, you know, I really think you ought to uh, think about, um, you know, doing a stint in government. What was the hook in the calling that resonated with what you were thinking or feeling at the time? Well, uh, at first, it was uh, repulsion. Um, the, uh, now, was it figurative kind of metaphorical repulsion or that kind of barf in your mouth, actual literal reverse peristalsis? Yeah, it was Baglobovich barfing. You know, yes. it was like the Illinois governor who tried to sell the Senate seat kind of uh, repulsion. Yes. And, um, and, and that, because when you asked me, you know, what I ever, have I ever considered it, of course, I said many of the things that were said here, no, you know, I'm afraid of, of all these problems um, of getting involved in government. But the flip side of that was that I was also really concerned about where our country's going um, with the kind of leadership we have. And the, and the state that I grew up in for the, my first 20 years uh, has a, Illinois, which has a history of problems in politics, um, compared to the, the state I've spent the last 20 years in, Colorado, which has an incredibly refreshing approach to politics, uh, one that's much more entrepreneurial, uh, led by our entrepreneurial governor. And uh, so it was really the combination of Jeff's calling and calling and calling, and the good government practices that uh, Governor Hickenlooper has put into pr place here, which led me to believe that, you know, if I can make a difference, I should try. Awesome. Kristen, um, do you have a hard job or an easy job in the government? <laughs> um, it's, it's Quite challenging. <laughs> Hold on now. Have any of you gotten frustrated at your computer, or you know, maybe your iPad it isn't syncing the way it's supposed to, and that thing keeps going around and around? Frustrating, right? Challenging. <laughs> now imagine being in charge of information technology for the state of Colorado. Um, now, this is a big job. What, what kind of PL are we talking about? Money's flowing through you too, right? You've got a lot yeah. of money coming budget-wise. Right, so we spend about $300 million on IT services and, and spend um, per year. Got it. And now, what did you do in the private sector that would prepare you for such a, a large challenge? Yeah, so prior to coming to the state, I was at Oracle, and I was responsible for Oracle's global data centers and computing operations worldwide. Awesome. So how, how phenomenal is that? The governor decided, hey, you know what, we want great leaders from all sectors of our society represented in the cabinet, um, folks who know the government, who have been around the block and who actually you know, know how to, to work within the government. Also folks who've had you know, really spectacular uh, careers like the three panelists here in the private sector, uh, which may or may not prepare them for success uh, in government. Let's go to Q&A. Boom. That's your turn. It's your cue. Cue audience. Q&A. <laughs> uh, yes, back there, please. Coming from the uh, private sector, talk to me a little bit about speed. And what I mean there, you know, as an entrepreneur and, and executives making decisions, those decisions are made. Sometimes the, the execution on those decisions are next day, next the next week, that quarter. Um, and, you know, you always hear about government, the bureaucracy behind it. What what are you guys experiencing with, with that and the decisions you guys make yeah, and how things are being implemented? Speed in government, right? Speed's a core cornerstone of innovation. So how, what does innovation in government actually look like, you know, from a speed perspective? Yeah, so I'll take that one. Um, so I've actually found it to be really fast. So government... Wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. I think there was some, <laughs> there was some interference the here. Yeah. Yeah. Can we get it? <laughs> now, did you say really uh, slow? No, no, I oh. didn't. I, I find it... Um, you know, Stology, yes. bureaucratic. No, 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 no. So, Kicking the can so down government, the path. <laughs> government is designed to go slow so that we don't create harm or, you know, instantiated uh, disruption in society. Having said that, I think that the opportunities for innovation and speed to execution <laughs> is like nothing I ever experienced in the private sector and I think Anna said it yesterday that sometimes when you're coming from a really large corporation such as I did with Oracle those companies can move just as slowly and it can just be as bureaucratic to get things done and I found this freedom to innovate like I've never I've never experienced in my career actually all right now uh, good governor can we just reflect for a second on uh, how do you 
how is it even like physically possible to move fast and be innovative in government? Can we get a mic? Oh, quick, quick, quick. We have scant time together. We have many minds to sort of like convince that there, there is a such thing as innovation in government. Yeah, how do you, how do, you do that in government? You do everything you can. You grovel, you, you do whatever grovel. I, I won't get into the details. Read poems. Uh, but, but try to attract people that have a sense of urgency and that recognize that this is a serious problem and that, that if you get those right people together and, and people that aren't stuck in silos, that, that look forward to working with teams and cross discipline, uh, across disciplines, then all of a sudden it gets the, the paradigm gets turned on its head. And it's me thanking them. You bet. Bouncing over to Kathy. I would add to that. There is a lot of opportunity for change um, within the state. And so being able to do some of those things very quickly happens in 18 months. We've been we've done some remarkable things in 18 months, put in new financial systems, et cetera. So it does happen because there is so much opportunity and there's so many low hanging fruit opportunities that you can seize upon to make it happen quickly. Uh, seizing upon it's interesting. So um, I used to be in the 98 percent of you who you know never would want to work in government or even, you know, I didn't really know much about government, and I, I thought it was slow, stodgy, not innovative. Um, uh, I, I got a call from someone on the governor's transition team to come help apply best practices of hiring, which we do in my firm in the private sector, to this daunting task of, of picking cabinet members. Because, you know, you get elected governor, you have a very short amount of time to hire basically 26 really important leaders in your cabinet. And I almost said no. Because uh, I, I, I thought it'd be a waste of time. I thought all government hiring decisions were, you know, political appointments of fat cats who are trying to, you know, use the role to, you know, for personal gain and all this. And, and I was shocked. I, I was actually completely wrong in my perspective of, of what's possible. So uh, the governor's leadership, seeing these guys in action, uh, was so inspiring. I wrote a book on this topic, and it's really for private sector leaders. Uh, because uh, there are 2.2 million leaders in the U.S., and 79% of them are in the private sector. But so very few of them you know, ever want to or, or, or take a leap and work in government. So the book's called Leadocracy. And so I found, there it is. And I'm actually, we'll hand some out to folks. I don't know on what basis, but if you interact with us up here, there's a chance you might get a, a book. So I, I was curious, you know, is Governor, Governor Hickenlooper and his team, is this an anomaly? Is this like a one-off? So I went on the road and interviewed a whole bunch of private sector leaders who worked in government and found the same thing. This exact insight that we just came to is innovation's possible, speed's possible, but it's really a choice. And if you don't choose it, it, meaning the kind of momentum, the inertia of the system won't be innovative, won't be fast. But if you make a choice, you can actually innovate. More Q&A. More Q&A. Who was the first Q&A guy? The first, who's the speed guy? I'm not gonna whip this back there. That would be not cool, not cool. Let's do some more Q&A. Oh, thank you, sir. All right, right there. Sorry, you, sir. Uh, I think it's fantastic uh, what's, what's happening by shifting at the top level, uh, the cabinet, but what would you say, Aaron, this probably isn't for you uh, after three weeks of working in this position, but uh, what would you say for the others that um, for the time you've been in the position, how much of your time is spent on trying to shift the culture versus actually trying to do what you envision in your head? Do you have like a, a tag team question or something, or are you just trying to get your queue and your question in the queue for next? Is it kind of like that one or is it totally different? Totally different. Awesome. You're up next. So, yeah, uh, you know, so hey, guess what? Right, so just hiring great leaders at the top, that's part of the challenge. There are real obstacles that exist throughout the organization. Are, aren't there, Kathy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I, no, no. Our state's workforce is dynamic. There are There is so much talent. There's a lot of opportunity, as I mentioned before, as the word of the day. Um, I think the, the key there is most employees are looking for dynamic leaders, and they want to do good work. But what has happened is there's been a lag in the leadership and being able to really um, engage our staff to really want to do something different or do something more. How big more. is the staff or the number of employees? We have 100,000 employees statewide. 100,000 30,000 that the governor is responsible for. Yeah, 100,000 people. That's right? the legislature, higher education, um, all of the different departments. So we're, we're the second largest employer in the state next to the federal government. 
So it is hard. So we're not here to tell you, um, you know, it's easy. Uh, sir. Jeff, one, one yes, comment please, on please. that. I, you know, what I always tell my staff is, um, and this is probably not a great metaphor, but the fish rots from the head. So uh, what that means to me, and, and I say that is, She's got lots I know, of I'm saying, I'm, what I'm saying going? is, this is going? no, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, um, if, it's, if, it's, if we're going to change culture, it has to start at the top, and yep. that means that we have to emulate the behavior and the values and the things that we want to see within the state, and, and it is permeating down. It's a process. Um, but this cabinet, and I want to acknowledge our my colleagues in the audience. Um, this, yeah, this, other this members is the of the, of the uh, cabinet, please just stand up yeah. and uh, and receive just a little bit of our, our appreciation yeah. and praise for your service. Yeah, these are tough jobs, very tough. Roxanne White, chief of staff, who also contributed yeah. to this. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, it, it starts with us, and it starts with. Um, good government and demanding more and having that expectation that we will be accountable, we will be transparent, and we're going we're gonna to change the world. And that's really the esprit de corps that we have within this cabinet, which makes it so remarkable. And our job is to make sure that that gets deeper into the organization so that we leave a legacy. Because the employees have this um, phrase, it's called Weeby. And they say, we be here before you got here, and we be here after you leave. <laughs> and so our goal is to not, um, is to leave a legacy for the organization so that they can then take it forward um, into future administrations. I think the talent required to pull that off is actually really high in, in the public sector because, um, you, you know, you do have folks in the 100,000, you know, employee ranks who want to kind of outlast you and that sort of thing. So... Um, so in my humble opinion, it doesn't require an average leader to occupy the roles that you uh, occupy, but like an exceptional leader who can, you know, really motivate and focus Absolutely. and hold accountable those folks. Sir, question here. Yeah. Uh, I just want to go back to the issues of innovation and productivity. In the 1960s, uh, Baumol, the economist, argued that the service sector was the symbol of the economy because you couldn't make the productivity increases. So all had to come from the manufacturing. And that... That issue was partly solved in uh, the 1980s, 1990s, and up to now we know that the service sector, especially through IT, from retail and other sectors of the of services, is actually driver of the economies now. But it seems that the public sector, at least in Europe, is becoming the sinkhole of the economy, to use Baumol's uh, notion. Why hasn't the IT revolution in all other sectors translated into productivity increases in the public sector? Does anyone on this panel know anything about the IT revolution? And are, can we expect uh, productivity gains by using IT more intelligently in the government? So, um, yeah, it's it's a great question. I remember one of my first days, um, I got a call, and uh, um, they'll remain anonymous, but they said, IT's down. And I'm like, what do you mean IT's down? The lights don't work. You know, you can't get in the door. What's going on? The, the, the understanding of IT and the use of IT in the state is um, it, it's, it's not where it needs to be. When I walked in, I have about um, 1,000 people. There's around just less than 800 um, applications that we support. The average system age of the systems that support those applications is 10 years old. And over so that'd be like Windows yeah. 02. Right, 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 right. Exactly, exactly. We have, Seriously. you know, 33 data centers. We have, you know, 15 email wait, systems. Wait, wait, how many different data 33 centers? 33 data centers in this, just the state of And Colorado. how many different email systems? 15 different email systems. This is systems. when you inherited your yeah. role of head of yeah. IT. Yeah. 15 different email systems. Yeah, and we had critical, critical applications, um, such as our eligibility system for Medicaid and welfare and food stamps that was you know, in, in bad shape and had been in a horrendous situation for over 10 years. So what are you doing about it? Yeah, so so we are. <laughs> I've been here a year and a half. Give me a break. Yeah. Yes, I know. See, see my, my wonderful legislative friends are out there. Um, so what are we doing about it? We're actually fixing those systems. And um, in April, we went to a web-based platform. We increased, increased the um, system speed by 30%. 
Now over 80% of the transactions are actually processed in four seconds or less. We're, how many of the 15 email systems? Are we still on 15? We're going to one. We're wait, going wait, to the many? cloud. We're going to one. one email and, system. and we're going to um, Google Apps for Government, a cloud-based system that's managed outside of the state. So we're doing things. And I know I just have to take one point because it's not just about – we've talked a lot around innovation happens from – um, improving within and we're doing that but we're also innovating in ways that I don't even I think is actually leapfrogging because we're so behind in some ways we get to leapfrog um, some of the technology aspects so let me give you as an example and I'm, I'm sorry but I get you know I do have an inner geek even though I don't look like it That's all right. um, so today a Colorado will walk into the uh, DMV right they'll go in they'll fill out the form name address, you know the, the, the drill. And then a week later they go into the Department of Natural Resources to get a park permit. And they go in, they fill out the form, they you know write in their name address. To your point, all the data is siloed. And so we started asking questions like, what about if we could correlate hunting and fishing registrations, licenses to the economic development impact of that region around hotels and restaurants? And what about if we could actually figure out how to track children from the time that they're in pre-K to the time that they're workforce ready at 20 to figure out what educational choices did they make? Mm -hmm. And did they go private? Did they go public? What was the best education? So you're saying we're in a position in this day and, and age we're doing it. to use information to you to yes. make better decisions yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and this might improve it's the quality of life of the citizens it's so yes. cool and and so in may in may um uh may 31st we actually launched the colorado information marketplace and it does two things one is it links the data across the agencies that were previously siloed so um, there's another example from Medicaid. Oh, we don't have time okay, for another okay, example. Okay, okay. But what okay. we do have time for <laughs> is another question. Okay. <laughs> right there. Yes, so you. So great. So I kind of feel like I'm uh, in a 12-step program. My name is Liz. I've worked for government for 26 years. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm still standing. My name is Liz. I've worked for government 26 years. Yes. Um, so I've worked for the city of Boulder. And um, I would like to note that Aaron moving his business out of the city of Boulder was partly responsible for the creation of the position that I'm in. So um, You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you and not so thank you. <laughs> and other time. I think we've talked about that a few times. But um, I guess the point that I wanted to make is in the many positions I've held in Boulder is that I think one of the most innovative ways um, leaders in government can be effective is to empower the government employees. So my experience is every government employee knows something that needs to change. They know something that needs to be improved. They know how to do it. They know what needs to be done. And if they are in a position to uh, make those changes and encouraged and rewarded, and um, frankly, the reward is even not important because they feel the reward just by implementing those changes. Um, I've moved from a, a role where I was in very much a regulatory position controlled by codes in a, a regulatory planning mode to doing economic development where I have programs that I don't have to go through ordinances and votes and changes to implement what we need to do. Mm -hmm. And um, we can be innovative as heck. Yeah, so. right, okay, and, okay, I like that. Uh, so it's something around, it's something around, yeah, so there are rules and regulations and, and policies and that, that's a good thing, you know, generally, you know, in, in places where it's, you know, not a good thing, you can actually change the system, which is nice. There are so many hands up. Let's get, let's get, way in the back with the glasses, please. Yeah, Aaron's to-do list. Yeah, Aaron's to-do list. All right, great, right? So, right. so yeah, what's your new title and, and, and what do you want to get done in this experience, both, you know, output-wise, but also, like, what do you hope to get from the experience? I want to keep my marriage together. Yes. Is that number one? Um, so thank you. Um, the, uh, I'm on a listening tour right now. So uh, that's uh, step number one. Although in terms of pace earlier, you know, we were talking about pace of government. It feels like and reminds me, the pace that we're working at reminds me of when I was in the newspaper business straight out of college and we were meeting those daily deadlines for anybody who's ever worked in journalism. It feels a lot like that. So it is a, a very quick up-tempo environment. So in terms of my to-do list. Wait, wait, did you say up-tempo? <laughs> yes. This is, the, this is the government? It can be up-tempo. It can be. So there's it nothing is. written in the Constitution. We the people will be 
down tempo in our <laughs> administration of our government duties no. and dower. Yeah. Okay. Both. Yes. Down tempo and dower. Both. Okay. But uh, no, I, I guess uh, that that must not have reached this far west. Wish list on 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 impact. Assume the listening tour goes well. So it's yep. not like he's coming in as interesting, uh, you know, with your agenda or something. You, you're coming right. in, you know, wanting to make a difference. So you're on your listening tour. Best guess of like what what might you know hit the list of things that you'd feel proud of. Yeah. Basically, what I'm trying to learn right now is who the constituents are for the uh, Colorado brand and what their objectives are. So that's where I'm starting. I'm trying to figure out how can I serve the needs of the state. Uh, so that, you know, is constituents will be for the brand, for the Colorado brand. Of course, it'll start with uh, an embodiment of what we stand for as citizens of, our, uh, of this state. I'm so excited for this, too, because uh, we really haven't had a chief marketing officer in the state, right? And, and yet, you know, job creation pretty darn important, like marketing the state to employees and employers, right? You know, tourism, all this, right? So, so it's such an important uh, function. And I think, you know, Colorado is sort of underbranded or undermarketed. You know, there are lots of brands that, you know, where the, the branding's kind of splashier than the actual substance out there in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, Colorado is one of these brands where, you know, it's actually better than our branding. So, so I'm excited for that. More Q&A. Uh, how about you, please? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we're I want out of books. I want, I, and you know what? I don't take them. Those gonna, I serve. Give them to somebody else. Back awesome. There. Uh, um, see, I, I'm missing someone. Yes, in the, in the way back there. Sorry. Your question, please. So I want to talk about politics. Say, for instance, one out of the three of you, the first day, first couple weeks on her job, um, she had a, a joint budget committee meeting, and the committee defunded her department, like in the first ten minutes. And was that of the an meeting. uncomfortable moment for her? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I kind of enjoyed it myself. I'm not sure, that, I'm not sure that they really understood what defunding was at the but, time. But right. I, what I want to know is, is how you all cope with the fact that for a third of the year, there's some predominantly crazy people across the street, a hundred of them. <laughs> and their goal in life is to make your life miserable. I'm just wondering how yeah, that works Yeah, Kathy, for you. please yeah. Re respond to this question. And, and with that, a, a big question that comes to mind is like, like, what is the mindset of doing this work, knowing that all you know, these, these sort of you know, threats and challenges exist? But yeah, please address her question. And, and like, what's the mindset they use to get through the day? It's funny, not having worked in government before, um, I underestimated the value and the contribution that the legislature makes in terms of how our oh, departments run. Honestly, <laughs> thank you. Um, honestly, because um, when you're in the private sector, you own your own budget, and you. This is the one question I get all the time. What's different? Yeah. Budgeting is dramatically different. Mm -hmm. In my former roles, I've always had the ability to manage my own dollars, and so if something wasn't working, I could take dollars from X and move them to Y. No one ever thinks about it. No one ever asks you any question. As long as the bottom line matches and you're actually saving money, everybody's happy. Here, however, you're managing against a budget that someone else tells you. So no, it doesn't matter how great our ideas are. It doesn't, I mean, all of that really is, I mean, it's such a big ship that those things sort of come naturally. But in terms of innovation and the budgeting and the, that interaction, it's all about telling a great story. I think one of the things that have made our administration very successful is that we've been able to say, okay, fresh set of eyes, this is what I think the needs are and this is how I think it's going to be better. And then my responsibility is then to influence folks like you to say, hey, this is un, you know, untreaded waters and we need, we need to really focus on this particular issue. And I think there's a lot of value in that, telling a fresh story and having a new set of perspectives. And so while I think it's important to have someone else managing those dollars, it is difficult because most of the time those individuals they're looking at the bigger picture and it's very very difficult for them to really want to focus specifically on my needs in my department yeah and so it's a balance but I think having a fresh set of eyes and someone telling a good story makes a difference got it mindset of how to do your job sir you've been at it a year and a half yeah. you've been at it a few weeks like what what is a healthy mindset for an entrepreneur or a corporate type and you've been both and you've been a corporate leader you know you know doing a stint in government like what is the mindset yeah so i mean i, I did this uh, well i didn't want to do this and um you didn't want to do this yeah no you were like kind of career jacked i understand yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of like that can you just tell us just a little bit about the career jack and this is a sidebar this is like just kind of an interesting story but how, how did you get career jacked well so i was flying um back from tokyo and i got a call from somebody on the transition team for it and they said 
Kristen, we've elevated the position. It's Secretary of Technology. It's going to have economic development. It's also going to be CIO. It's a great job, but we don't. We actually don't know who can do this job. And so I start going into my Rolodex. I'm like, Have you talked to this person? I'm and the person on the other line said, No, you don't. You don't understand what I'm asking you. Um, I think it should be you, and this is your time to serve. And I said, Oh no, no, no. I don't do public sector. That's not. That's not where I go. And he said. But Kristen, you can, you'll be forever known as Madam Secretary and you'll sit on the governor's cabinet. And I said, I don't know what a cabinet is, and two, I don't want to be called secretary ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so I, and I was actually interviewing for another job, and so, but you know, I got this second round, I met Roxanne White, fell in love with her and just her leadership style, and, uh, and so they called me in to meet with the governor, the lieutenant governor, and Roxanne White. So the, the governor and some of his team call you into the office, and, and, and what happened in, in that meeting? <clears throat> well, there's two versions of this story. <laughs> um, no, no, no. I, okay, well, I'll, tell, I'll start. Okay. So I go in. Um, it's a little intimidating. You know, there's a lieutenant governor, Roxanne White, the governor, and he, he says... Um, well, first of all, and you have to know, like I talked to my husband who's actually in the audience and I said, oh, um, I'm going to go, I'm just going to interview with the governor because it'd be kind of a good story for the girls. Like I could have worked for the governor at one point in time. And, and I had no association with John Hickenlooper and, and my husband Scott said, um, it, you know, this isn't on our financial family plan. Um, so I said, I know, I know. Listen, I'm just going to meet the governor and then I'm going to shut him down. So um, I walk in. This is all true. Um, I walk in and he, the first question is, why do you want this job? And I'm like, damn, I don't. <laughs> so I, of course, you know, thinking on my feet, I'm like, why would I ever, um, Governor, that's interesting because the first question on my list is why would I ever take this job? And then... And so did he do like a PowerPoint or like a, <laughs> like what was the, like the communication medium used to maybe change a mindset in this case? No, go ahead. So, oh, okay, so he leans across <laughs> to his desk. And he gets this PowerPoint And out. he gets this book of Garrison Keillor. No, no, wait, 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 wait. First, <laughs> first, so we're clear, so, just so we're completely like, clear, oh. I said, so what, after about two minutes, and I mean literally two minutes, instead of trying to figure out, you know, could you do the job, is she the right person, I said, what would it take to get you to come work here? Mm -hmm. uh, and, I mean, we just cut right to the chase. And she, uh, I said, well, what does it motivate you? What do you care about? She said, well, something that's really important to me is, is who I work with and the people I work with and th that, 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 that tone in the office. And my, old, my best friend from high school, was, I was a uh, pitcher and he was a catcher. I was a very slow pitcher. Uh, a junk ball pitcher, as they called them. Anyway, he sent me this book of Garrison Keillor's favorite poems. And there was a, a, a wonderful book by a, woman, a poet named Marge Piercy. Uh, on what's it the on the value of work what, to, to be, be of use to be of use sorry right. to, to be of use and the last uh, you know it starts out with the people I love the most are the ones who swim hard strokes and you know get down in the mud and pull like oxen and then at the end it says you know Hopi vases uh, were made to carry Hopi va Hopi vases uh, sit on museum shelves but you know they were made to carry water. Uh, a, a pitcher that cries for water. A pitcher carry. cries for 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 water, and a person for work that's real. Yeah. So and I read the whole I, for work that is real. Right. Yeah. And so I read her the poem, and then the rest is history. No, no, it's not history. No, <laughs> wait a second, no, wait a no. Now, Here's my first. Now she claims Here's it was like. A, I have. Yeah, it was Let's hear your version. Okay. It was it was <laughs> incredibly <laughs> awkward, and I actually. Um, <laughs> I was sitting there. It's a and, very short poem. No, 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 no. <laughs> Two minutes, 15 seconds. I've timed this thing. Because <laughs> I was like, that felt like forever. And, um, but, but I did say to you, I said, regardless of what happens in this process, I will never forget that you read that to me. And so Roxanne White leaves the room. And um, I said, what, what are you going to do? And he said, well, you know, I, you know, Roxanne's out of the room, but, you know, and I might get in trouble for doing this, but I, I think we should offer you the job. And, <laughs> and, uh, and then Roxanne comes back in and she goes, so did you, you know, did you close the deal? And, and, uh, and then I get home and, and before I left the office, I had basically accepted the job. And, 
Um, I get home and Scott goes, so, you know, you shut him down, right? That's, that was our plan this morning when you left. And I said, well, uh, not exactly. Um, he said, well, you didn't take the job, did you? And I said, well, he read me a poem. I mean, All right. what, what am I supposed to do? Now. All of us walking along the paths of our career uh, have a landmine waiting for you in your path, in your career. And I believe that that landmine is a sense of stagnation. Uh, so my firm has done like 10,000 interviews of CEOs and, and all, mostly all private sector leaders. And, and we've, you know, over half the people, uh, lots of folks, entrepreneurs, innovators, uh, people in education, people in um, in business, uh, corporate types. You, you hit a period where where you sort of feel stagnant. You wonder, you know, like what am I doing? You know, what's the value of my work? Um, and and it's not because you're a bad leader. It's just because that's that's sort of a fact of life. I'm here having sort of seen from a from a helicopter view ten thousand careers to suggest that doing something uh, different at some point of your career is a good thing for your life happiness, for your career enjoyment, for your, for your overall quality of life. So the, the weird hook that I wasn't expecting to observe in, in this private to public sector switch uh, is, is a lot of the folks that take these jobs do it um, because they're up for a leadership adventure and they want to apply their talents to a worthwhile goal. Um, so, and the, 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 founder of the positive psychology movement. There is such a thing out there. I have a PhD in psychology. When I got my degree, it was all psychopathology and negative stuff. Somehow they waited till I was gone before they study things like career enjoyment, career happiness. And this guy, is, his last name is, is extremely difficult to pronounce. It's, uh, his name is Mahali, Chixin Mahai. And he wrote a book called Flow. You know, about 20 years ago, actually, and he kicked off this, psycho this positive psychology movement and like really figured out that the quote I just told you a second ago is actually his, his word, so I'll attribute it. He said, um, we're happiest in our lives, not in the relaxing, reflective moments, though those are nice to have from time to time, but when our minds and bodies are pushed to their outer limits in the pursuit of a goal that's worthwhile. So that's why I'd love for you guys to consider as an out-of-box idea, you know, building a stint in government somewhere in your career uh, as, an, as, a, as, a, as a way to reconnect with, uh, with you know, challenging, meaningful uh, work. Um, and there's something that we with called the leadocracy pledge which is like if you Google leadocracy pledge. Leadocracy is the name of the book. It's kind of like a leadership democracy. Get it? <laughs> Opposite of bureaucracy. It's leadocracy. Um, and, and, it, and it means like, you know, leadership by society's greatest leaders. I want great leaders out of all sectors, out of the government, out of the military, out of education, out of the private sector, entrepreneurs, everyone. I'd love our best leaders to be the ones in government. A government is only as good as who's in it. Right, so uh, so we we cooked up this thing, the leadocracy pledge, and all it is is basically it's just like decide to do a two-year stint in government sometime in your career. That's it. That's the pledge. It's a pledge to yourself, but you can actually like sign it on the on the website, which is kind of fun. So um, uh, back to Q and A, right there, black shirt. So I don't know if this is a question for the governor, Roxanne, or one of the panelists, but I'm curious just for business who love the benchmark things. Um, of the 26 members of the cabinet, what percentage of them are kind of come, come straight out of the business community? And not that we're, and comparatively, if you went back one or two administrations, what would that number be? Sure. I'm just curious Roxanne, can you take ahead. that? So, like, how, how many uh, cabinet come straight out of the business community, and how does that trend line relate to previous uh, administrations? We, tr we tried to get a balance of a third, a third, a third, a third from the nonprofit sector, a third from um, for-profit business, and a third that had experience in government, and we achieved that goal. Um, both on the nonprofit side and on the business side, we have succeeded all of the prior administrations where there's records. We also had a commitment to, um, we never asked people's political affiliation. Wait, um, wait, I'm sorry, again, there's some feedback here on the mic. Um, 
So all these appointments are politically motivated, you said? I think that's what you said, right? Uh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. No, so, please clarify. Say that again. It's worth emphasizing. So, so as he just pointed out, he's, uh, what I said is we didn't ask political affiliation, and he said that even goes for chief of staff. And obviously, you know that I'm an unaffiliated voter, um, but we didn't ask. And we felt like we were going for the very best people. At the end, we had to know before we submitted people for confirmation. But that's the point at which we, we knew people's political affiliation. And again, I love I love that it's really mind blowing. Like I'd never heard of that before, and it, it's a, yet another sort of example of innovation being as simple as really focusing more on results and outcomes and talent, and and not so much on you know ideological nuance. And Roxanne's the chief of staff. In case you're wondering why we called on her, we figured she'd have she'd have that. Um, and uh, this is my last book to black t-shirt guy. And let's do more Q&A. Do you want us to end early so that you can have your day back? Or do you want us to end like when the, the buzzer thing goes? We can go to 1130. That's, that, that gets us back on track. OK. Um, good. Uh, back, let's see. We're right there. Bearded guy, please. I have the guy. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question for you. Um, rightfully so, there have been a lot of jokes throughout this panel about government and slow and politics and all that. And I understand that those wounds are certainly self-inflicted. But I just wanted to ask, so much of this conference has been about ecosystem and showing support and all that. Do you guys think that the negative uh, stigmas and that level of conversation surrounding government in general is actually doing harm to the ability for you guys to be innovative or recruit that talent that you're speaking about? So I would say it is because I think um, if, you know, perception is reality and if you don't understand how things really exist and how they really are or could be, then that's your only assumption. And that's why when Jeff asked the question, no, you know, very few people raised their hands. So I think that it is, um, it takes down the brand of government and we're trying to buoy that brand up. But with that, there's an opportunity. And I love the fact that we get to go out there and talk about what we're doing in Colorado that is so different um, because it is innovative. And it's it's almost this perfect platform. I mean, you know, Jeff kind of started out and, you know, said these jokes, but it's a great platform for us to say, and it doesn't have to be that way. We can actually change it and lead in a different way than than any of us have privately or even in the public sector. Aaron, I'd like, yeah, I'd like to add one quick thing to that is the primary reason I got you know into this seat right here was that uh, I decided that I didn't want to be one of those people just sitting on the sidelines, pointing fingers and um, berating our, our government. And I said, you know, I'm not going to do that. It didn't mean I had to go to this far extreme, but um, but I said, you know, you know I'm going to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I get a poem. So, yeah. uh, so anyway, that's that's the point. So I, I take action and, and jump in and try to make it better. I think it does make our jobs difficult because perception it becomes reality, and so as our workforce thinks about how we're perceived, they sort of live that reality, and that doesn't challenge them to do more. So our task or our responsibility is to make sure that we are changing the perception. And all of my colleagues know I talk about that all the time. I talk yeah. about it exhaustively with my staff. We cannot live in the perception that's out there. And so that's what I think our responsibility is to help change that. Awesome. Yes, sir. Just up in the back, standing up. Thank you. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for, to all of you for joining the governor and, and serving. And thank you, the governor and his team, for recruiting people like yourselves. Thanks, so I have a two part question. So, you know. It, in my common sense view, I look at government, look at the private sector, and see two very fundamental things that I just don't see ever changing in the government that give me some cause for concern. So All one right, bring is it. Let's, let's hear it. <laughs> Challenge one. <laughs> the two, the two, two challenges are one is that in the private sector, if something isn't working, it shuts down, right? And a new ones come up, and the cycle sort of really helps us become more efficient and more effective. The second part, I think, in relation to this first part, is that the issue of constant process improvement, transformation, and all those things which really make the efficiencies go, go up. Somebody had asked that question. 
and, and you sort of keep redefining how you do things as opposed to government where when you scale up you keep adding more people to it and it never ever goes down mm -hmm. it just it seems that the only way that they know how to 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 address the growing needs are to add another person to do the same thing the other person is doing as opposed to a transformational process of right. becoming more efficient so it seems to me whether how the legislature runs the budgets or mm -hmm. whether how you know the, it's all set up that really are you ever going to shut down a department that's not working and god knows there are plenty of those that don't right sure. so so at, so at the structure your concern your big concern here that mer merges your two questions is like it seems like it's self perpetuating in a, in a negative way and and it, it's uh, and so you shut a department down what would we shut down we closed a prison yeah. all right and was it like a prison worth closing yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. that's cool yeah it's uh, so I, I asked Mitch Daniels this question too just the the book here is like ha, you know it's it's 50 50 actually you know Democrats and Republicans talking in this book and and so you know um, uh, he said you have to byoA and I'm like, well, what was that? And he said, you have to, and Mitch Daniels, by the way, um, you know, uh, Indiana governor reelected with more votes of any elected official in his uh, state's history, like really did a good job. Other governors kind of looked to him as, as, a, as a great governor. And he's, he's going to be president of Purdue University now. Um, but I interviewed him for this book. And, and he said, to your point, I think you're right. The system really is not set up, you know, to have a spirit of continuous improvement and to allocate resources toward areas of highest value and away from areas of waste, which we in the private sector do, you know, quickly, right? Uh, but he said you have to BYOA. He said you have to bring your own accountability uh, to the role, and you you can do it. And it's really it's like it's like a really monumental leadership challenge. Uh, but it's it's the leaders. Period. You know, I think the system kind of is what it is, and and for me, that solution lies in. You know how to get more great leaders in who are willing to BYOA. Peter. Yeah, actually, question is, and this probably relates more to federal politics. Yes. Uh, you can, is a lot of people with private enterprise in Pilar. So this probably applies more to federal than state, but a lot of private sector people put off by the scrutiny that they're under, that they have to go through, and yes. kind of opening up their private lives, mm -hmm. and they just get they just turn away, and I think that's become a perception. And, so I'm interested in the panel's view. Right. So podcast. scrutiny as a as an obstacle to getting over. Yep. So running for president, obviously the highest possible level of scrutiny. Having a cabinet role in the executive branch at the state level, like for real. Now, like you know, for real. What does it feel like from a public scrutiny or um, uh, you know sort of confidentiality perspective of your? It's a fishbowl. Lives? We live in a fishbowl. You do live in a fishbowl. Absolutely. Um, every decision you make is scrutinized, and I know that there are some of our colleagues here who live and breathe that probably more so than my seat on the bus. Yes. But what it also does is drives fear to the organization because our employees then operate at zero risk. And many of you are large business owners and you know that you mm. can't operate in zero risk. The government tends to do that because no one wants to be on the front of any paper. No one wants to be embarrassed or embarrass their families, etc. So everyone operates with the least amount of risk possible. So we, we live in a fishbowl and so that's that a reality. So that factor sounds like really makes people risk averse, innovation Absolutely. averse within the organization. How, how, how do you think about this public scrutiny thing, your cabinet role, like what, what does it feel like to you? Yeah, so I, I mean it is an interesting, it's, it's a challenge, right? Because we are paid by the the color by Coloradoans and so we do have to be incredibly open and transparent but I think our administration is working hard to actually push that more because if we actually engage um, Coloradoans in the dialogue and we give them more information then they can be more informed and understand the complexity of the issues that we have to deal with um, whereas if you try to do this then it ends up actually back it backfiring on you and so for example you know we post data out there but we don't actually release it to the wisdom of the crowd so one of the things that we're trying to do is actually get um, data out there more on the Colorado information marketplace so that Coloradoans can actually go out there and, and rate the data they can suggest data sets that aren't out there they can actually use that data to do mobile and web applications um, 
themselves, which has an economic development factor. So we're trying to push that to say it is open and it is it is uncomfortable and it and it creates some interesting cultural nuances within the organization, but. Our approach is how do we then embrace that and understand the world which, within which we live and um, share more. Aaron, do you have yeah, just um, two quick ways to think about please. scrutiny to me. Um, there's constructive scrutiny and there's destructive uh, yeah. scrutiny. So, I, you know, I'm a big proponent. I, I expect, you know, all five million Coloradans to scrutinize uh, the work that's done and hopefully have a voice in the work that's done around the branding for the state. But destructive uh, and, and oftentimes maybe personal um, scrutiny um, rather than professional scrutiny. Um, maybe that's something that's kind of keep people out of this, uh, mm -hmm. keep, keep, make people afraid to run for office or, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. You bet. So it sounds like, uh, it sounds like being comfortable with the transparency of the role is just that you just have to just come to grips with that. And it sounds like your approach is more transparency. Yeah, yeah and I just want to say two more things. Is that one, it's about courage and being willing to say, like, yes, I made that decision and this is why. And we've had a lot of that. And the reason why we can do that is because we have leadership that we know has our back. All right, and net, that cabinet sorry, has our back. You had one other left. Nope, that's okay. it. Net, net, don't BS me now or our fellow innovators here. Uh, net, net, are you uh, happy or not happy to have taken this leadership job in government? Oh, I love my job. Uh, I think it's great. Did you say love? I love my job. She loves her job. All right, Kennedy, you're three weeks in. Are you, are you like, you know, oh my gosh, why did I do this? Or are you, are, is it like uh, net net? What do you feel like? Honestly, I'm totally energized by this uh, opportunity. It's, uh, it is the, the opportunity of a lifetime. Yeah. Kristen? Yeah, love it. Thumbs love up. It. So government can be innovative. Final question. Not from you guys, like, but I'll, uh, sorry. <laughs> Final question is the, is the survey we, we asked at the beginning. So in a second, I'm going to ask you if, who's interested in doing a stint in government sometime in your career. And it's a personal choice. We're not going to like hound you. There's no commitment here to anything other than yourself. But we had um, three takers the first time I asked the question. I'm sorry. I was just going to make, can I put in our, my final little two cents before you take a vote? Yes, please. All right. This is my, my opportunity to influence. If you are in a, a junkie on like energize work and you just like that really wakes you up every day to make change i have worked on occupy denver north fork fires um changing how we deliver our performance system our employees there is more opportunity for change so any person any leader in the room whoever is excited about that kind of stuff government's for you okay now you can go got it so uh, a challenge awesome. worthwhile goals and variety of work and relationships. So we'll re -ask. this is the moment we've been waiting for. Uh, if you were one of the three who raised your hands before, like we don't want to get too duplicate here, um, raise them again if you're still interested in doing a stint in government. Who are the three from before? Three from before, are you still in or out? You in or out? Like I, this is, this mind is mind. a net basis thing. <laughs> now, you three are locked. Thank you for, for sticking in there. You know, I will take Hesitantly. it. Now, do we have anyone else who has decided that they'd like to do a stint in government sometime in their lifetimes. Please raise your hands. Wow. Raise them higher. Holy cow, it's like 40 people. Ladies and gentlemen of the audience, panelists, governor, and staff, thank you so much for a really enjoyable panel. Thank you. Thank you.